So bear with me because today I'm going to introduce one of my uh, academic heroes. So uh, <laughs> it's very difficult not to use the entire hour to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, so we have Dr. Mary Murphy, who completed her PhD at Stanford University and received a National Science Foundation postdoc fellowship uh, at Northwestern University, currently as an endowed professor at Psychological and Brain Sciences at Uni Indiana University Bloomington. Um, Broadly speaking, Dr. Murphy studies how social identities interact with context, such as studying how situational cues affect important life outcomes, especially among students. Um, while the literature on mindset has traditionally focused on uh, changing the growth mindset of students of dis disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, what I, I felt very impressed by Dr. Murphy's work is that she is one of the pioneers in broadening the perspective and looking at how mindset can be a cultural variable in affecting the inclusion and uh, equity within an organization. Dr. Murphy has published high impact work in uh, over 80 articles in notable journals, uh, just to name a few, uh, Psychological Sciences, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Science Offenses, Social Psychological and Personality Science. Dr. Murphy's transformative research received fundings from numerous agencies such as NSF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, and her work is uh, recognized by multiple research awards, including recently uh, named the University Level 2020 uh, Distinguished Faculty Research Awardee at Indiana University. So congratulations, Dr. Murphy. Um, Dr. Murphy put science into practice, co-founding the College Transition Collaborative uh, to help promote inclusive and equitable environments in higher education. Uh, I know Dr. Murphy lived an example of being a great scholar, great teacher, great practitioner, great entrepreneur, and great mentor, but I don't want you to just trust my words on it. So I took some liberty, liberty to contact a few of her collaborators and mentees <laughs> to hear what words they would say uh, when they think of Mary. So here's how I'm paraphrasing this a few. Effective, popular, brilliant. Uh, this is from Nick. Uh, Baum and her collaborator, okay. a force of nature, passionate, insightful, trailblazer, thoughtful, insightful, kind and generous. These are from her mentees, Jenny Lacaz, Laura Wallace, Katie Kroper, and Elise Os Osier. Mm -hmm. Her colleagues at uh, CDC, Chris Smith and Sarah Woodruff, added that Mary is visionary, innovative, and fun with, with an exclamation mark. <laughs> Her fellow CPC co-founder, Christine Lobo, said she's saving her work and calling dips on presenting her for the uh, Society for Experimental Social Psychology uh, Distinguished Scientists of what Sunday. <laughs> so Christine said, uh, Mary just truly brings her skill and expertise in her mission to change educational institutes and workplaces to truly make places uh, that people can feel like they belong. And last but not least, um, one of Dr. Murphy's uh, mentors, Dr. Kelly Jack said, Mary is a huge superstar who, with her incredible mind and heart, is changing society in ma major ways today. So we're really fortunate to have Dr. Murphy today to share with us how to create cultures of inclusive uh, culture in um, higher education. Without further ado, please join me to welcome Dr. Murphy. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was maybe the nicest um, and warmest uh, introduction. Thank you so much. I know a lot of time and effort went into that. Thank you. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today, um, both online. I see we have over 50 people online and in the room here, we have probably maybe about 30 people. And I'm so happy to share with you um, some of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of decades, actually, um, focused on various ways that we might create cultures of inclusion. Um, so I'm going to start, let's see, maybe I'm going to start um, with a quote from my former advisor, um, Claude Steele. Um, and this is really sort of the predicament that has driven my career uh, over time. And it's one that, you know, my students and I really sort of take to heart. What Claude said back in 1997 was, from an observer's standpoint, the situations of a boy and a girl in a math class or of a black student and a white student in any classroom are essentially the same. The teacher is the same, the textbooks are the same, and in better classrooms, these students are treated the same. Is it possible then that they should still experience the classroom differently, 
so differently, in fact, as to significantly affect their performance and achievement there? This is the central question. So if we look at really what is the difference between, let's say, a boy and a girl or a black student and a white student, you know, what we talk about in social psychology is one of the things that is different between those individuals are their social identity. And just so that we're all on the same page about what I mean when I'm talking about social identity, because I know we're all from very different backgrounds, I'm talking about the part of our personal identity that comes from the groups that we belong to, right? So different examples of our identities, we can have identities related to our age, to our sex, to our gender, to our generation status, our religion, our sexual orientation, the region of the country we belong to, the university we belong to um, here at Purdue um, from Bloomington. Um, these are all social identities. And what we know from classic social identity theory is that different aspects of our identities are salient in different situations. So for example, if I'm in a church, my religious affiliation or lack thereof might be pretty salient to me as I engage in whatever the ritual or practice or service that is happening in the moment. Um, whereas if I'm in a classroom, different identities are made salient to me, right? I might be in my teacher identity or my student identity in those contexts. And so our research questions that we've been studying over time have really centered on two aspects. One is how do people actually come to know the value of their social identity in a specific setting? So for example, if I'm in this chemistry class or in that biology class, or if I'm over there in the union setting, how do, which identities of mine are salient in those moments and how does that matter? And then the second question builds on the first, which is really how do situational cues in our local environment actually influence that experience of identity and people's experiences of identity threat, motivation, and performance? So to answer this question, we developed a theory um, now uh, over more than a decade ago um, uh, that we called the cues hypothesis. This is that what happens, we believe, um, is that people look to the structure and cues in their local environment to determine the value and meaning of their particular identity in a particular setting. So there's lots of different types of situational cues. There are positive cues um, that are more identity affirming. There are negative cues that are more identity threatening. And then there's neutral cues, things like maybe, I don't know, the color of the floor or the color of the wall, right? It doesn't tell me much about my identity. Um, so it's a relatively neutral situational cue. And the example I like to use um, to illustrate that is that of um, Justin's, and you'll just bear with me on this um, as we kind of go through this example. So imagine that you are coming for your first day of work as a faculty member, and um, you're moving in as an assistant professor, and your lab there is in red. Um, and it's middle of the day now, and um, you need to use the restrooms, right? So you walk down the hall, and you enter the door uh, that is appropriate for your your business, no problem, right? Go back to your office. I say this is a relatively neutral. Are we having problems? Um, so. That should work now. So. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. All right, continue. This just turned off. Okay. I call this a relatively neutral structural cue because while our identity may be some quite salient as we walk into those rooms, um, there's no negative contingency or concern about one's identity necessarily, uh, given these options and given this context. However, imagine that you're walking into the first day of your professorship as an assistant professor. Now you're walking into the building, which is actually the math building on Stanford's quad, the main quad, structured like this, right? No, forget gender neutral restrooms, right? They don't exist in this building. Um, and you'll notice that there's one restroom for women um, located here in the basement. And so you say, what is going on with this, right? Like what, as you had go down every time you need to use restroom, two floors down to the basement, what does this mean, right? Like, does this mean that there's a lot of bias in this context against that group? Does this mean um, that I'm devalued in this context? If you do a little research, you find out that those oldest buildings on the main quad of the campus were built like back when the university was built. This was always the math building. And then when the university was built in the late 1800s, um, this building, you know, the only women in the building in the math building were secretaries and they were located in the basement, right? <laughs> so you might wonder why in the year 2022, this has still not been updated, which it hasn't, I double checked. 
um, and uh, you know what it means today. But it doesn't necessarily. My point is that it doesn't necessarily reflect the bias of the people right now in the moment, unless you think about has there been reason to not do this? Um, but this is a structural cue, right? This is a cue that might affect the way in which um, people experience their identity on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another sort of infamous cue is that of number. So if I'm in a math class and it's structured like this, my experience may be very different than if I'm in a math class where I am one of very few that share one of my identities um, in the context. And one of the things we want to note here is that these kinds of situational cues like numerical representation can interact with real names and the stereotypes relevant to them. So that if I'm in this classroom and this is an English class, my identity, the fact that I am numerically underrepresented here, let's say as a woman in this context, um, you know, might not mean as much as when it's represented and uh, numerically underrepresented and it's a math context where there's negative stereotypes about my group's competence in this area. So what I'm arguing is that when the settings cue signal the potential for threat, one's identity becomes strongly felt and psychologically central. And there's consequences of that happening including affecting the psychology of group members in many ways. We become vigilant. Claude talked about it's like a snake in a room, right? You can't quite, you're looking for the snake in different places and you can't quite relax because you don't know if it's gonna be over there or over there or over there. That's what threatening situational cues will often create. Um, it reduces our sense of belonging. It interferes with performance and learning and it also affects the physiology of group members. So what I'm going to show you today are a couple of different, I'm going to show you three different contexts or cues uh, that help create either more exclusive or more inclusive environments in higher education. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the studies about how we know that these cues have impact on people's outcomes. And then I'm going to end with um, a, a new intervention that we've done with college and university faculty at six universities around the country to sort of create more cultures of inclusion in their classrooms and to show you how it's impacted students. So the first study that um, tested this cues hypothesis simply asked the question, if we manipulate the situational cues in someone's social environment, does it have an impact on vigilance, belonging, physiology, and people's desire to be there? So what we did in this study, this was um, back in graduate school, um, and it has since been replicated by several other different labs. Um, but what we did here was we created a summer science conference video, and we had junior and senior college students come in who are in STEM majors, and uh, we had them watch the video to decide whether or not the university should actually host the conference the following summer. And so in one condition, because we're sneaky social psychologists, we manipulate various things in the video. What we manipulated here was that numeric representation cue. So that across seven minutes of the video, uh, people saw a relatively balanced gender um, representation about one to one, men to women in that context. Whereas in the unbalanced video, they saw what is typical at the highest levels of STEM environments, which is more three men to one woman uh, across the video context. And what we hypothesized was that though people were in their junior and senior year and more used to that unbalanced video kind of dimension, um, that that unbalanced video will still create identity threat for women watching it because it's a new setting. They're trying to figure out, do I belong at the summer conference? What is, what is going on here? How would I interact in that particular environment? So our hypothesis in particular was that women watching that unbalanced video would show greater physiological reactivity measured in multiple ways um, lower sense of belonging in the conference, um, a decreased desire to participate as well. So this is the first uh, data graph here, where this is interbeat interval. This is how fast one's heart is beating. And what you can see is that women watching that gender unbalanced video um, have a faster heart rate. So the, when you go up, this is more um, less time between uh, beats of heart rate. And so you see women um, experience faster heart rate during watching the video um, compared to women who were in the gender balance condition and for men there was no effect. Um, this is skin conductance. This is how sweaty the palms are when you're watching the video, right? Galvanic skin response. Um, and what we see is that women watching that unbalanced video show greater galvanic skin response compared to the other three groups. Men don't differ. Sense of belonging. How much do you feel like you might belong at that conference? Women say, I feel like I'm going to belong much more in the gender balanced conference than the gender unbalanced conference. And again, for men, no effect. 
But where we found um, effects for both men and women, and just it was just the main effect uh, that we found, was that both men and women wanted to be where the women were, <laughs> right? Probably maybe for different reasons, but nonetheless, we found this main effect that it was preferred both by um, men and women to be in that gender balanced context. So this video summary um, of the study really just showed that women watching that unbalanced video showed greater physiological reactivity, lower belonging, lower desire to participate in the context. And this was just some of this initial evidence that we had, that these identity relevant cues, they shape people's psychology at multiple different levels, their vigilance, belonging, and desire to be there, as well as their physiology. So I'm now gonna talk about two other cues. Um, numerical representation is certainly one. Um, it's one that a lot of times people say, ah, I don't know what to do about that, right? I can't like force people to come into STEM context or other kinds of things. So people kind of sometimes just wonder about that cue. I'm going to talk about other ways to build that in that we've shown faculty to do uh, in their classrooms. Um, but I'm going to also talk about two other cues that I really see as opportunities to create these inclusive environments. So let's move to bureaucratic hassles next. So bureaucratic hassles, what are bureaucratic hassles? They are difficulties associated with the structures or procedures of an institution. We all know bureaucracy, right? Um, most people find bureaucracy pretty frustrating. There are a couple of people who really love bureaucracy, um, but not very many. Um, and you might think that, you know, how could this be related to inclusion or group membership, right? Technically, it should be relatively unrelated to group membership and frustrating for everybody. But we have the hypothesis that these bureaucratic hassles might hold identity threatening meaning, particularly for underrepresented and first generation college students. So when you have to go through bureaucracy during your college transition or in the time of college and you don't have that social system in place to help you navigate the meaning of those various frustrating situations, um, you know, it might actually serve as an identity threatening cue, making college more of an identity threatening setting for first generation students. Um, so what are bureaucratic hassles? This is a bureaucratic hassle. This is a course map, um, not taken from a, any uh, class here, um, but you know, you might say, okay, how do I actually navigate what courses I need to re register for in what order? in my first year, second year, third year, if this is the major I want to pursue. And if you think that I'm just cherry picking, right, um, a particularly bad uh, bureaucratic hassle, we can look at a lot of these, right? This is what they look like, and particularly bad in STEM context, I will say, um, but this is not untrue that, the, um, that this is only in STEM. So what we did is we tried to bring that experience of bureaucracy um, into the lab to see how it would causally impact um, people's experiences. So um, what we did was we created a web form. We told students that we were collaborating with the financial services office to create a different kind of intake process in order to um, you know, have your uh, forms uh, submitted to the uh, office. And so what we did is we created a web form um, half of our participants completed the web form and then moved on to the next part of the experiment, no problem. The other half um, were unfortunately randomly assigned to our bureaucratic hassle condition. And they completed the web form and when they hit submit, they got this error, right? Which we know intimately, unfortunately, um, you know, and this web form was particularly sadistic because it um, erased all of your information and you had to start over again. And it did it three times, web form, right? Bureaucratic hassle. Um, the manipulation check was out of this world, like huge effects. It's frustrating to be in this condition compared to the other condition. Um, and so we looked at how might this affect people's sense of belonging in college, right? Um, things like, I feel like I belong. I feel like I could be myself. I feel like I fit in. I feel like I'd be accepted in this environment. Um, for continuing generation students, whether they had the frustrating or the non-frustrating form, it didn't make a difference. They felt like they pretty much belonged in college. But for first generation students, this made a big difference in their sense of belonging in college. We also asked them how likely did they think it was that they would get a degree four years later, sort of graduating on time um, in college. And it also impacted first generation students in the same way. So we did a second study, now just with all first-generation college students, because that's where we see the effect. And we sort of mirrored and mapped on, now not using frustrating web forms, 
and not in a SES kind of um, financial services kind of uh, context where there might be even more threats based on first generation identity where students mo uh, are more likely to come from lower SES backgrounds than continuing generation college students. So we wanted to sort of disentangle those identities, um, those identity threats. And um, here we're just focused on first gen students and we're back to web, um, we're back to uh, course maps and major maps. And so students were randomly assigned to either see the simple course map or the complicated course map. And the goal here was to tell me what are the courses I have to take in what order in order to complete this major. And we had them for various majors. We randomly assigned them to the major so they were unlikely to get their own major, for example. Um, and again, the manipulation check, this is extremely more frustrating to be in the complicated uh, condition than in the simple course map condition. And we replicated the same effects. Um, we saw that students experienced much lower belonging in college um, when they were in the complicated course map condition than in the simple course map condition. And then what we wanted to do was see how this would actually play out in the real world. We wanted to do a field study outside of the lab with people you know, experiences of life um, and the bureaucracies that they actually come across um, in their regular college experience, transitioning as high school students into college. So what we did in, in this case is we measured students' experiences of bureaucracy, how, what were the, the high bureaucratic tackles that they experienced and how much did they find them frustrating? So we looked at those um, aspects and um, what we found was that this is, again, just first generation students, those who experienced high bureaucratic castle over here in the green, um, they reported less belonging in college in the second week of term, and unfortunately that persists over time, we also measured it later in the fifth week of the term. And then we followed these students over the course of a year, and we looked at whether or not they would actually be retained in college one year later. And what we found here were significant effects such that students who were in high bureaucratic capitals, they experienced high bureaucratic capitals at the beginning of their transition to college, they experienced more belonging uncertainty. Those who experienced more belonging uncertainty were much less likely to be enrolled in college one year later um, relative to those who had low bureaucratic capitals, right? Um, and this is like about a 25 percentage point difference in the percentage likelihood of students being um, enrolled one year later in college. So that's the second tool uh, that we are talking about today, numerical representation, bureaucratic hassles. Now let's talk about my entire culture. So um, here I'm going to talk about interactions with faculty and with mentors, advisors, staff, and what we communicate when we are interacting with students, both when we're teaching and then also in our one-on-one -on -one interactions. Um, and so let's talk about what mindset is, right? Um, Frankie sort of started us off on this. Um, mindset was first uh, discovered and, uh, and, and called as such uh, by Carol Dweck in the 1970s. Um, and she talked about mindset as people's personal beliefs about the malleability of different characteristics. We might think that ability, intelligence, talent is something that's fixed. You can't change it very much. You either have it or you don't. Um, or the growth mindset, which holds that these kinds of abilities are relatively malleable. They're potential that you can develop over time, right? By applying the right strategies, seeking help and applying effort uh, through challenges. And so, Almost all of the research on mindset up until about 10 years ago, um, focused on mindset as an individual difference. That has a consequence. So we were looking at how your mindset influences your outcomes, how my mindset influences my outcomes. And in that time, what we had to do if we wanted to move people from a fixed or growth mindset is we had to move their mindset. There was something wrong with their mindset, right? And as this actually blew up in the K-12 setting, we started to see a lot of teachers starting to now use mindset as a label. That kid just has a fixed mindset and there's nothing I can do about it, right? Um, because that, and you see how ironic this is, right? In mindset to like talk about it that way. Um, but nonetheless, we saw sort of that's how the uptake was. So about 10 years ago, um, Carol moved to Stanford when I was finishing up my PhD in my last year. And, you know, having thought about cues and context uh, for, for many years, I said, Carol, has anyone ever thought about mindset, not as a feature of individual psychology, but actually as a feature of the environment, as a cultural variable, 
And she's like, no, we should do that. So we did. Um, and we talked about mindset culture. And that's what I've been, one of the um, pieces of my work uh, that we've been moving forward quite a bit in the last 10 years. So when I'm talking about mindset culture, I'm talking about the beliefs of powerful people in a setting. People like faculty members, teachers, advisors, in a workplace that might be supervisors or bosses. And what do we believe? about talent and ability. And just as the fixed and growth mindset are on a continuum when it comes at an individual level, so too can mindset culture be, and faculty's mindsets can shift between their fixed and their growth mindset. We know this from many experiments where they put people in, they read an article and they move towards their fixed mindset, they act in terms of that, or they read a different article, they move to their growth mindset, they act in terms of that. So our mindsets um, are valuable <laughs> and they can move between the fixed and the growth. And when we're talking about mindset culture, we're talking about um, these beliefs of powerful people that are communicated through what we say and do. What are the norms that we set in our classroom? What are the policies, the practices, and the interactions with students that communicate that we believe intelligence is fixed or intelligence is malleable? So for example, um, if you are coming to your first day of class, I'm the professor. I have 65 intro STEM faculty recorded as part of a, an effect grant, their whole uh, teaching for a whole term recorded. And I still found, this was in 2019 before the pandemic, like five people still saying, look to your left, look to your right. Only one of you are not going to be here, or only one of you are going to be here at the end of the term. So this is something people are still saying. Or they might say, listen, if you're not a science person, you really should consider dropping this course. What we think is that this is going to cause individuals to think, wow, do they think I belong here? Do they think people like me or myself, do I belong here if they think only some people are going to make it or that the right kind of science person is the kind of person that, that belongs here? Um, you can contrast that with what uh, other faculty members might say on the first day of class. Listen, this course builds from material from your previous courses, 501 in this case. If you need to review those concepts, we're gonna be able to connect you to resources to do it. So this is learnable. We can actually help you along your way, your journey of learning here uh, to get to where you need to be. Um, or it's normal to be challenged by material at some point in the term. When that happens, please reach out for help. Again, normalizing struggle doesn't mean you belong here or you don't. And actually we're gonna help you um, reach out to us. There's a strategy here for you to actually learn. Um, this course. And so what we think students will infer when faculty give these messages is that, listen, maybe all students can learn and grow in this course, right? As long as you're doing the mindset things, uh, like, you know, reaching out for help, following up with those resources, everyone can learn in this context. So how my faculty's mindsets actually influence students' experiences and performance in those faculty members' classes? We had a couple of hypotheses. First, you might think, well, if my faculty member communicates more of a growth mindset in their practices and their policies and in their interactions, maybe it just lifts all boats. Maybe it's just good for all students' engagement and performance. And if you looked at the mindset literature at the individual difference level, you'd be hard pressed to find places where the fixed mindset tends to be good, better than the growth mindset for any people's outcomes. So you might say, okay, maybe we just expect a positive main effect that everybody, when a faculty member has more of a growth mindset to a fix, all students' engagement performance is benefited. But we had a second hypothesis, um, being uh, a person who studies identity threats and uh, threatening cues. Um, we found that perhaps we might see even stronger effects for students who belong to groups that are negatively stereotyped regarding those dimensions of belief, of mindset belief, intelligence and ability. So that we thought that maybe for students who are negatively stereotyped along dimensions of intelligence and ability, they would experience the mindset of faculty even more strongly than those who belong to groups that are not negatively stereotyped along these dimensions. So in the American context, that's people like Black, Latinx, and Native American students, first-generation students, low-income students, as well as women in STEM context. So why would this be the case? Well, let's take this from the student perspective. If I'm a student and I believe that my professor endorses more fixed mindset beliefs, I think that they believe that STEM abilities are relatively fixed. And what do I mean by STEM abilities? This varied based on, on context. It might be spatial rotation. It might be computational abilities. Whatever is required to do well in a particular class, that's what we mean here. These abilities are fixed. They can't be changed. You either have them or you don't. I think my professor believes this. What am I going to infer? Who belongs in this context? 
if that's the belief, only some people have it, you either have it or you don't. Well, you're gonna use cultural stereotypes to fill in that gap. And so we thought the inference students would make was that, listen, this professor who thinks that some people have it and some people don't, they're gonna expect the white guys or the Asian guys, right? To be, have more ability than say black, Latinx or native students or women in STEM context. Because that's who the culture says, quote unquote, has these natural talents and ability. Whereas if I, as a student, think that my professor endorses more growth mindset beliefs, I think that those same beliefs, the computational beliefs, the spatial rotation, those are things we can improve with effort and learning, right? And so we thought the inference students would make here is that all students, regardless of their identity group, as long as they're pursuing those growth-minded strategies of putting in the effort and adopting the right strategies, that they could be successful in this context. So ultimately, theoretically, what we put forward was that perceiving a STEM faculty member to endorse a fixed mindset would create a context of stereotype threat, putting certain students from these backgrounds, from these groups at risk of confirming those negative intellectual stereotypes about their group. How would we know this is happening? We should expect to see the same kind of effects as we see in the stereotype threat literature, such that underrepresented racial and ethnic minority students should underperform relative to their white and Asian counterparts, but much more so in the context of the fixed mindset and much less so in the context of faculty's growth mindsets. So we test this in an institution-wide faculty mindset study. We, we got all the STEM faculty at an institution to respond to a couple of mindset questions because faculty self-reported their mindset beliefs. Then longitudinally, we looked at seven semesters, 600 courses, reaching over 15,000 students, right? STEM faculty teach a lot of students. Um, and we wanted to see how faculty's mindset might relate to students' performance in their classes, in that particular STEM professor's course. And what we found consistent with our first hypothesis was that we see a main effect here. On average, students perform worse in courses when faculty members self-report more fixed mindset beliefs than when um, faculty members uh, report more growth mindset beliefs. But also consistent with hypothesis two, we found that the racialized achievement gap in faculty members' courses were twice as large in the courses taught by faculty who self-reported more fixed mindset beliefs. Now, when I looked at this, I've been studying gender and race in STEM for many years now. And when I looked at this um, pattern, this interaction, there's many ways to look at an interaction, I wasn't so much impressed by this. Many people outside were kind of impressed by this, but I was like, no, what's really interesting, this is a very highly replicable racial achievement gap in STEM courses, right? That's about the size that we see in many STEM contexts and it's reported by the NSF um, in many STEM contexts. Um, I thought this was really interesting. The racialized achievement gap was halved in courses taught by faculty who self-reported more growth mindset beliefs. So what are faculty doing differently there that's having the racial achievement gap relative to the fixed mindset faculty? So we wanted to go deeper, we wanted to understand that, and we wanted to understand more about how it would affect students' experiences as they were sitting in the classrooms of these faculty members. So what we did was we had, um, we enrolled first and second year college students. Um, they were taking um, one of 50 introductory STEM courses across four different universities. And we conducted an experience sampling study. First, we asked them for their STEM faculty members and their TAs, um, because we also included labs. Um, we asked them, what did they think the mindset beliefs were of these individuals? We used a face balance and a Dweckian item. This faculty member or TA seems to believe that some students have a certain amount of intelligence. They can't do much to change it. That comes straight out of um, the mindset literature. We asked several questions related to that. And then we um, created an app that basically went off for students at the end of every class. It was sort of a program for their particular class schedule. And we asked them their experience in that class. And we created a composite called Psychological Vulnerability in the paper we report each thing individually as well. But we kind of looked at their psychological experience, their sense of belonging, their concerns about being evaluated, their feelings of being an imposter, their positive or negative aspect in the context, right? 
And um, we only analyzed the surveys that were conducted, completed 15 minutes between uh, after the end of their course. So we knew there was no less retrospective bias, wasn't sort of end of the day or that sort of thing. So we ended up with um, over 7,000 surveys and we analyzed them with multi level modeling. Um, but I'm just going to show you overall here the process model results that we found. So before we thought that faculty self reported mindset beliefs, have impact on student performance. Now we're looking at how students' perceptions of those beliefs influence their psychological experience of class and other downstream outcomes. So what we found was that perceiving your STEM faculty member to endorse more fixed mindset beliefs increased students' psychological vulnerability in that professor's class, in the moment of learning, right? Lower sense of belonging, greater evaluative concerns, more imposter feelings, and greater negative affect. And why does the psychology matter, right? If you're not a psychologist, you might be like, psychology is mushy. Um, <laughs> but it matters because it predicts really important downstream outcomes that we care about. Things like course engagement, how much they attend class, the dropout intentions that they might hold, and the amount of effort that they even tell you that they're putting in the class or not. It also affected their interest in the discipline, not just in, in the particular class, I'm interested in this chemistry 101 class, but now I become less interested in chemistry as a field, as a function of being in this faculty member's course where the faculty seems to endorse more fixed mindset beliefs. And then replicating the previous study, we found that it also lowered course performance in the same way, uh, and it lowered uh, performance when faculty were perceived to endorse more fixed mindset beliefs. So what can institutions do? How do we create more inclusive cultures in higher education? One of the answers is attending to the mindset culture. So this is something that we've done over the last two years of the pandemic. <laughs> um, it's called the Student Experience Project, and there's a website dedicated to it. And all of our resources um, that we created for faculty to use in this project are available online and free uh, for people to uh, take and use as well. Um, so the Student Experience Project, Um, it starts with a particular theory of change, which isn't going to surprise you now um, at this point. We thought that growth mindset cultures affect students' experiences with learning, that sense of belonging, the feelings of imposter, the things I found, showed you before, which we think influences students' engagement, their motivation, their ability to focus, which should in turn um, affect performance and attention. So what we did in this project first was we created some diagnostic tools. We worked with the ACLU and USU um, to figure out what universities we wanted to bring on board. And they were all urban serving universities. Um, we brought on six universities through a um, request for proposals process, and then created these diagnostic tools to understand as a cohort, these institutions, what commonalities do we see in terms of the concerns and issues on, on the ground among students? And in particular, um, the uh, equity concerns for students. And it's not gonna surprise anyone that after many surveys and, and institutional assessment of historical data that structurally disadvantaged racial uh, group students, students from structurally disadvantaged racial groups and those with high financial stress were way more likely to experience identity threat than their peers and they were much more likely to have higher D, F, or withdrawing, getting a D and F or withdrawing DFW rates in their gateway STEM courses. That was true across the university context. And so what we did was we created reports that got the highest level buy-in. Um, we weren't going to proceed with schools unless they had provost and in some cases presidential buy-in to do this work because we were going to ask faculty to engage in this. We wanted to be sure faculty were seen as, you know, um, getting the benefits of doing this. They got some kind of, um, you know, uh, reward for doing this within the institution. And what we did as as a group was we actually created what we call the student experience index which focused on five different aspects of psychological experience that either in our own work or in the survey work we did across these institutions seemed to increase student engagement and persistence and drive more equitable outcomes close achievement gaps in higher education and so we created a composite of these measures and this is what the experience is that we had faculty try to increase in their classroom, communicating more of a growth mindset, increasing students' belonging, increasing their identity safety, increasing the extent to which they trusted and thought they were being treated fairly by their faculty member and their self-efficacy. And we didn't use a randomized control design, which is kind of, you know, to my experimental colleagues, you know, like, what? We didn't do that? No. Instead, 
and try to use what we um, we've actually brought in an organization that does the most rigorous um, continuous improvement design that can be found, where we actually were able to engage with faculty over time to plan what practice they were trying to engage in, to do the practice, to study it and get their own data. I'm going to show you what faculty saw on a regular basis of their own gaps in those psychological experiences, and then to take action again. And this allowed us to actually measure what practices faculty gravitated towards, the extent to which they engaged in them. And it also helps us understand that if you do certain practices, you might have better impact over time that could feed into an RCT um, compared to other practices. So we kind of studied that process in this first iteration of the project. So what we did was we created a classroom change library um, where faculty um, were able to go in. I'm going to show you what some of these uh, changes or practices look like. We measured student experience with a app called Copilot Ascend that was created for this project. And then we really were aiming for institutional transformation. We engaged with systemic change by having these six institutions have these cross-institutional working groups to figure out who are the best faculty at doing this, how are they doing their practices, and how do we actually bring that kind of practice to various campuses to be used and tested in other contexts. And then student voice was really important in each aspect of this. Students gave us feedback on the change practices, they gave us feedback on the measurements, and they were part of these institutional working groups. So we created this practice library. Again, this exists online at collegetransitioncollaborative.org. Uh, um, and we also had faculty go through some skill building workshops um, in which they sort of saw the practices in use and got some feedback on them. Um, faculty then received um, their own data on a regular basis as they engaged in the Copilot Ascend app. Um, usually faculty did this at the very end of class, maybe three or four times during the whole term. It takes a very short period of time. And faculty get to see, broken up by identity group, the different psychological experiences of their students. So this is a belonging um, you know, measure. And what you see is you have a bit of a race gap here in belonging. You certainly have a gender gap and you definitely have a gap when it comes to high and low financially stressed students and how much they feel like they belong in your classroom, right? Then what faculty would see as they engaged in these practices and they did again the ascent feedback, they'd see whether or not they were actually able to change students' experiences across the term. So what do these practices look like? This is um, kind of a small uh, version here, but they're PDF. Um, in the actual project, we had these kind of automated so we could collect the data from faculty um, as they were engaged in the practices. They always kind of describe what the phenomenon of the psychological experience was, gives you examples. What does this look and sound like? What does it not look and sound like? And then a checklist to be sure that the way in which you're engaging in the practice actually has fidelity to the research. Um, that it was conducted from. So what are the results of doing something like this? Well, what we found, um, and I'm gonna show you the data from the first, we call it the pilot term, um, it was fall 2020, everyone was moved online, six colleges, about 100 faculty members. What we found was that every college's pilot team was able to grow student experience. And that was particularly true along the dimensions of belonging and identity safety for their students. Some faculty were very good at this. Right, they increased students' uh, sense of belonging by like 20, in this case, 27 percentage points um, in that particular uh, biology class um, for Black and Latinx students in particular. And so what we did um, was over the course of the semester, we also found another outcome is that the share of students reporting positive learning experiences on the student experience index increased overall by 32%. Um, and then what we found for those positive, uh, we call them positive deviant instructors, those who are very good at improving student experience, we then looked at the way in which they were using the practices. What are the ways in which they actually did this in the classroom? We were then able to have them teach other faculty who were in similar classes um, about how they engaged in that practice, right? We would have these consortium kind of meetings in which we would lift the practices of these positive deviant instructors, these very talented instructors of doing this work um, so that others could learn and try those practices. And what we found was that the teams were extending and they continue to extend this learning to other areas of campus change. This whole idea of using student experience to decide what practices I should do and how to do them was very sticky for schools. 
they started to use it about how do I give my early alert systems? Is this gonna increase student experience in a positive way or is it gonna make students feel as though they don't belong, right? How about the design of the physical or the virtual space for academic probation and so we created automated tools that allow faculty and, and, and administrators to test A-B testing of this against student experience to find out what would be the best messages to send. So this is some of the data from that first cohort. What we see, not surprising, is when the faculty members are engaged in the student experience project, student psychological experience does increase. This is just first week to midterm significantly. Um, that psychological experience, this is the student experience index on the um, x-axis, and this is the probability of getting an A or B on the y-axis, and what you can see is that as students' experiences increase as their faculty members engage in these practices, students were more likely to get an A or B in the class, they were less likely to get a D, F, or W in that professor's class, and when it comes to these identity threat concerns, you see that for structurally disadvantaged students, for women, for highly financially stressed students, for transfer students, and for first generation students, you see benefits to the probability of them getting an A or B in the class when their faculty member is engaged in these um, practices. So what we have here is a set of practices um, and an approach, right? Everything here is digital and scalable. Um, and what we've done so far is now I showed you the data for um, you know, about 12,000 students and about 100 faculty from our fall pilot. And now we've scaled up over time and we are gathering the uh, outcome data, which is cool. You can imagine six universities trying to get all your outcome data at the same time. It takes a long time. Um, but we are now also funded to start doing some of this work in community college settings where underrepresented students are actually more likely to get their college uh, uh, education than in four year institutions. So, how can we change institutions scale? This is what I want to do. This is institutional transformation. Um, one of the ways we think this could help, I mean, this is not a silver bullet. It doesn't all close all gaps, right? It's still, there's still gaps that remain, um, but it goes a long way to supporting students from underrepresented backgrounds. And so what we want to do is make these tools and approaches easier to adopt and more sustainable. We're looking at ways to integrate them with learning management systems. Um, we're also partnering with other networks and systems beyond the USU schools to actually bring on board more schools to um, uh, work in this context. We also think we can use policy and other media to incentivize institutions to center experience. So we are working with um, other organizations to think about using student experience in some form in school ratings. If you have huge gaps in belonging at your institution, um, you know, between black and white students, shouldn't people talk about that, <laughs> right? Shouldn't that be used? Doesn't that count for something, right? And the schools that are able to narrow those kinds of gaps, shouldn't that have some meaning? Um, we're also looking at, um, you know, really actually doing the math on the ROI for improving student experience uh, for retention so that institutions can sort of see why this is important for their ultimate bottom line outcomes. Um, and then we're thinking about certifications for quality student-centered teaching that kind of use this, these kinds of tools. Um, and we are also working with some student groups on student advocacy of this because um, students are engaged in this kind of work as well. So ultimately what I'm saying here over the course of, of the hour is that these stereotypes and the situational cues that make them salient really shape people's experiences and their performance in social, academic, and professional settings. We have a whole nother set of work done in the workplace, but that cues like numerical representation, bureaucratic castles, and the mindset culture that surround us um, as we learn are really important and that people are gonna look to the structure and cues in their local environments to determine the value and meaning of their identity in those contexts. And this takes us to an argument that we've been making for some years now in the literature, that our psychological theories, now I'm speaking to us psychologists in the room, right? Our psychological theories often locate the problem of prejudice within people. But we know that prejudice is gonna stem, yes, from people, some racist, some sexist, right? Some homophobes exist, um, but also it's gonna stem from places. And we define prejudice places as those with predictable systemic inequalities and in experience and outcomes based on people's identity group membership. And the prejudice in places model aligns more 
than the prejudice in people model with structurally disadvantaged group members' experiences, right? Um, it really sort of shows what is the experience of the individual and how is it influenced by those contexts and the cues within the context. And it illuminates sources of inequality that would otherwise be overlooked and it also allows us to figure out novel ways for intervention. Now we're gonna focus on the cues, the context, the practices, right? As well as the people. And this mindset culture work is a good example of that. When mindsets were solely located in people's heads, the only thing you could do is change people's mindsets, right? That's an individual difference. You need to change the people. It masked the consequences as well for structurally disadvantaged people when you only think about it as an individual difference. You weren't able to see how someone's mindset influenced someone else's experience. When mindsets, though, are conceptualized as a characteristic of people and places, then you start to understand the disparities in experience and outcomes. Those become visible to us and they become targets of change. The targets of change are the culture creators who shape and maintain either cultures of genius or cultures of growth in their policies practices, interactions, and leadership messages with, as what we saw, equitable or more inequitable consequences. So I'm gonna leave you today with three questions um, that really kind of guide our work and are guiding what we will do going forward. First question, what if we could create environments that minimized threats to belonging and potential? What if we reduced interpersonal or institutional signs that you're not smart or that you can't cut it? What would our inequalities look like then? how much human potential could be unleashed. I think it's a lot. I hope that you'll join us in this. And uh, I wanna thank you today for listening. Thank you. Thank you.